everyone, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you're new. If you are an old time subscriber, then you probably recognize this video title as something I've been promising to do on this channel for years, like at least half a decade now I think I've said I'm going to film a video all about the classical myth and history references in Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games. Well, here I am, <laughs> many years later. We are finally sitting down to film it. I may in part have been inspired by the fact that I recently saw A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes in the cinema, so my uh, love of Hunger Games was rekindled, uh, but for whatever reason we're here, we're here now. Presumably, if you are watching, you're either a fan of Hunger Games, a fan of uh, mythology, history, or all three, and we're gonna talk about all three here. So. Basically what this video is going to be is a little bit of a deep dive on Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games trilogy and um, prequel A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, looking at all of the references to classical myth and ancient history within them, predominantly breaking down um, some of the characters who are named after historical or mythological characters and the person they are named after. So I'll talk a little bit about the Hunger Games characters and the um, sort of Easter eggs in there, but this is largely going to be about the ancient side of things, the mythology and the history, whether it's Greek or Roman. And I will be going into a little bit more depth in terms of like the myths and the historical figures than I will in terms of Hunger Games. I also feel like there might be some small spoilers. I've, I've not really thought it through, but there could be small spoilers for Hunger Games. So um, just heads up if you've uh, not read or seen the series. And if you haven't, what are you doing? Because Hunger Games are fantastic. I highly recommend them. Love both the film franchise and the books. Um, have watched and read them all multiple times. So this is two things I love in one video and I'm excited to share them with you. But without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? Now I actually want to start a little bit more broadly talking about the world of the Hunger Games series, uh, Pan M, where it is located, the district and uh, the history and storyline surrounding the Hunger Games uh, themselves and then we'll get a little bit more into the characters. But I think it's really interesting to know that Suzanne Collins has been quoted in interviews um, referencing the ancient Greek myth of Theseus and the Minotaur as a partial inspiration behind the Hunger Games. So I wanted to do a little bit of background and tell you about the story of Theseus and the Minotaur because it's one that I think a lot of us recognise the names of but don't know the details of and it's actually really interesting when you consider the overlap there. Now there's obviously a lot more to the Hunger Games that um, goes beyond this myth that is unique and different and separate and all its own but there are certainly those strands there and you can see the thematic overlap from a story that uh, we first have cited over two millennia ago to a story that we've all read and enjoyed um, in the past few decades. So let's talk about Theseus and the Minotaur. So the story of the Minotaur really starts with King Minos, who is the ruler of the island Crete. Now, long story short, Minos was supposed to sacrifice this beautiful white bull to Poseidon that the sea god had sent to him, but it was such a beautiful specimen that he decided to keep it and not sacrifice it to the gods, which was obviously incredibly disrespectful. So in order to punish Minos, Poseidon actually cast a spell, puts a curse on, uses his magic on Minos's wife, Pasiphae, which is just typical of uh, ancient mythology. The woman is the one that is really hard done by there and <laughs> gets drawn and dragged into this whole punishment scenario, but that's uh, neither here nor there for right this moment. Um, so the uh, curse on Pasiphae is that she should fall in love with this bull, naturally leading her to lust after it. Um, and in order to consummate this lust, she approaches uh, the kingdom's resident inventor, Daedalus. Yes, the same Daedalus who uh, eventually goes on to invent wings that he and his son Icarus used to escape Crete. And Pasiphae goes to Daedalus and says, make me a heifer suit. Make me a nice looking cow suit that the bull will fall in love with. Um, yeah. And he does it because this is his queen. <laughs> What's he to do? And she dresses herself in the bull suit. 
uh, under this spell, bearing in mind, so this is not a um, nice story in any way, shape or form, and she gets what she wants or what the spell makes her want and she falls pregnant. So um, Pasiphae, Minos' wife, uh, queen of the island, is now pregnant um, with a child that is not her husband's. And when the child is born, he is half bull, half man, aka the Minotaur, um, who gets his name from Minos and Taurus uh, being bull. So that's where the Minotaur comes from and Minos not a fan, not a fan of this uh, this half bull stepchild of his wife's um, so he decides to have it sort of enclosed slash locked away hidden in um, a labyrinth, something that would be very difficult for the Minotaur to escape um, but in which they can still send it offerings and food to keep it chill. And uh, therefore, Minos once again goes to do this and says, you know, make me something to put the, the, the Minotaur in. And he builds a labyrinth, which is the famous labyrinth of the Theseus and the Minotaur myth, in which the Minotaur lives. So that's where the Minotaur labyrinth part of our story comes from. But for the second half of our story, we need to go to Athens, where we meet Theseus. So Theseus is an Athenian prince and for years now his people, the people of Athens, have had to sacrifice a group of their young citizens. Oh there's a cat outside my window, hello? Oh it just wants to come inside and say hello. I guess this is how Prim felt. Um, when she found uh, that scraggly cat in uh, District 12. Right, um, back to the story. So for years now, Theseus's people have been sacrificing um, their men and women to the Minotaur because of a deal that they made with King Minos after King Minos's son died at the hands of the Athenians. So there's various different versions of how the son died, but because of that, um, a deal was struck in which uh, Minos takes sacrifices a little bit like tributes from the Athenian people annually and places them in the labyrinth where they are um, killed, eaten, who knows, by the Minotaur. And finally the year comes around where Theseus says, enough is enough, I'm old enough now, I'm going. I am volunteering <laughs> as one of this year's tributes. <laughs> I am um, going to volunteer um, as one of our sacrifices this year, but my plan is not to just be sacrificed, to defeat the Minotaur and end this deal which keeps leading to the death of all of my people. So Theseus goes off and when he arrives on Crete uh, he instantly takes the fancy of Minos and Pasiphae's daughter Ariadne. Now Ariadne thinks yeah, yeah I like the look of him um, and uh, there's a bit of wooing going on and she offers to help Theseus. And of course you might have heard what happens next, Ariadne gives Theseus a ball of thread. And this is the thread that Theseus uses um, to sort of chart his course through the labyrinth so once he has slain the Minotaur he is able to once again escape. And that's what happens. It all seemingly has a happy ending. Ariadne gets on the boat to go away with Theseus because really her dad's not that happy at this point. Only Theseus ends up betraying her and abandoning her on an island. So she definitely gets um, the short end of the stick in that story unless you consider the fact that she does eventually get to marry Dionysus, god of wine and parties. But that is my brief, very academic summary of the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. And I think already you can see the parallels there. I think the part of the Theseus and the Minotaur myth that people are least familiar with is um, the middle part for me at least when I talk to people, is they're not familiar with the part in which Athens um, has to give Athenian people to Minos to sacrifice to the bull in this labyrinth and that Theseus volunteers to go one year. I think that's the bit that often people aren't familiar with but actually it's really the bit that is the biggest um, link I feel to the Hunger Games which is really interesting because as we know uh, because of the district's defeat they have to you know sacrifice their kids every year to the Hunger Games and when Primrose's name is called her sister Katniss volunteers in her place so Katniss is in some senses our Theseus um, although I think Katniss is definitely preferable given the way that Theseus treats Ariadne. On the topic of Katniss's characterization though I have seen people draw parallels I think are worth mentioning here between Katniss and uh, the Greek goddess Artemis or the Roman goddess Diana who is the goddess of the hunt. Now I'm not sure if um, Suzanne Collins has ever acknowledged um, any inspiration there but I think in a lot of ways the goddess Artemis or Diana has inspired many female figures who are seen as uh, like huntresses. She's had an impact on just like our public consciousness around that idea and uh, in addition to the fact that Artemis slash Diana is a goddess of the hunt, she is skilled with a bow and arrow, 
She is also the goddess of uh, young women and a virginal goddess. And I think that can be seen as mirrored in Katniss in the fact that she doesn't want um, to take anybody as like a lover or a boyfriend or a husband and um, because of the political situation that she lives in. Um, she might change her mind eventually, but at this moment in time, she's not interested in romantic love um, at the very beginning of the story. So I think that is like a worthy comparison. I definitely think it's an interesting one. Moving on from mythology though to history, I also think I think there are um, parallels worthy of note in terms of Pan Am and the Hunger Games links with Roman history, particularly Roman history. And I think you'll notice when we go through the character names, there are more Roman names than there are, say, Greek names. And most of the historical names and historical um, character inspiration comes from ancient Rome. And I can very much understand how this came about and see the links there, in particular in the popularity of the Roman amphitheatre and the gladiators fights that were held within these amphitheatres which really reached their peak during the early Roman Empire and um, so the first couple of centuries of uh, this millennia uh, there was like a real peak in terms of um, gladiatorial fighting um, in which gladiators often fought to the death in which prisoners were often forced to fight to the death um, in which also um, people who had been uh, taken during uh, war or colonization were um, basically just like murdered in front of everyone for popular entertainment. The amphitheatres were a site of violence. They also set gladiators up against wild animals from far off lands and it was just like blood and gore and horror and people turned up in their hundreds if not thousands to witness these fights and these games and to witness this level of violence and the Roman Empire is by no means the only example of this. I mean public executions <laughs> were still a thing in Britain until the 1900s. I mean, there are plenty of examples throughout history of um, quite horrific things being seen as entertainment. And it's very easy to see um, how a scenario like the Hunger Games could realistically come about, given historically how similar things have also happened, like in the gladiatorial fighting. Then perhaps, like a little bit more loosely, I think it's also worth noting um, that Panem is a place of districts, there is the capital, and 12 once upon a time 13 districts, and Rome itself was a um, place separated into districts or provinces. Now there were more than 12 or 13 and the number of provinces varies depending on which emperor we're under and what time period we're in, but it is a place of provinces. So I think that is interesting in itself as well. But now that we've covered some of the basis of the world building and where I see the connections between um, history and myth and the Hunger Games, let's move on to the characters. So rather than run through characters as they're introduced in the books, book by book, I've decided to sort of separate them into subsections in terms of the um, categories of ancient names they are drawing on. So the first category are actually mythological figures um, whose names are used in the Hunger Games uh, books or in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. And I have covered all four books, although is there a possibility I've missed out a name or a character? There certainly is. So if you notice any that I failed to mention throughout this video, please do leave them in the comments down below because I'm sure both myself and anybody else watching this video would appreciate it. But like I said, I'm gonna start off with the characters whose names come from myth. And this is where you see the greatest number of Greek names and that's possibly, potentially, because a lot of um, names in Greek and Roman mythology are the same. Um, but sometimes we find Greek names here uh, that do have different names in Roman mythology. So so it's not like a, a generic, you know, um, uh, just like standard sh Roman names have been used. There is Greek names in there too. And also interestingly enough, and I don't know if this means anything, I found that most of the mythological names came up in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, uh, particularly given that that's one book versus three. So yeah, let's get into it, shall we? So first up we have Io Jasper, who is one of the students at the Academy in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. So um, of ages with Coriolanus Snow, who attends school with him and becomes becomes um, a mentor during the 10th Hunger Games. And it's interesting because a lot of the characters in this section um, of my, my little list are actually um, students at the Academy in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. It feels like a lot of those students have um, Greek myth inspired names, which is interesting, I guess. So the Io of Greek mythology uh, was the daughter of a nymph, a mortal woman whom Zeus took against her will. Now, I do 
disturbingly find uh, quite often her referred to as Zeus's lover in text and online posts, but most, if not all, of the ancient texts contain no consent between them. So I just, so I just, I just want that acknowledged, basically. Um, but Io is um, taken by Zeus um, and forced to become his lover, we could say, uh, which upsets Zeus's wife Hera. Now Zeus has quite a lot of affairs, consensual and non-consensual. So non-consensual would not really be affairs, but considered affairs uh, by Hera, his wife, and these make her very angry and very jealous. But she can't take out her rage on Zeus, so. Um, unfairly she obviously takes out her rage on uh, the women that he has either abducted or seduced and in this case uh, she comes after Io but in order to protect Io from Hera Zeus turns her into a heifer or a cow um, and Io in this scenario becomes becomes a cow um, presumably so he can go to Hera pfft, I haven't taken a new lover or abducted any women recently. I just got a nice cow. But Hera knows exactly what's going on. So she asks Zeus to have Io or the cow as a present. She goes, that is a lovely heifer. Can I have it? And Zeus doesn't really have any reason to say no because uh, he doesn't want to tell her that this is actually a mortal woman that he turned into a cow. So uh, without any concern for Io, he just gives her away. In order to keep an eye on Io the cow um, and not to have Zeus steal her back, uh, Hera sends one of her servants, Argus, um, who is like a hundred-eyed um, giant, to watch over her. But not willing to give up, Zeus sends Heracles to slay Argus and then steal back Io for him, which then results in Hera sending a gadfly to um, forever hover over Io and sting her and irritate her and just like torment her. Now eventually Io does manage to escape across the sea to Egypt where she marries a king and turns back in to a human woman so it's not all bad the ending is definitely better for Io than the beginning um, but that is that's that's the story of Io in terms of any like connection between the character of Io in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and the character of Io in mythology I can't really see any and that is the case for I'd say most of the characters here, especially when it comes to side characters, particularly side characters who have mythological or historical names, I don't really see a blaringly obvious connection to why they have that name, although some of the more central characters there are. Um, however, I don't think that really matters, I still think it's a fun reference, so let's carry on to the next character. Like I mentioned, we have a lot of Academy students, including the next one, which is Iphigenia Moss from A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. She gets her name from Iphigenia, a, a princess of Greek mythology and the daughter of Agamemnon. Now, Iphigenia is another woman with a tragic tale. She is taken from her home uh, by her father, who has promised her mother and her that she is to be married off to the hero Achilles, and that's where that's where he's taken her. It's during the Trojan War, and he's like, you're going to marry Achilles and he takes her off um, but instead of marrying her off to Achilles he sacrifices her in the hopes that it will give them better conditions uh, in which to fight and sail and just I mean I just really feel for Iphigenia it really sucks um, but in some versions of the story that's that's exactly what happens Iphigenia is sacrificed in some others she is spirited away by a goddess um, from this whole situation, although not much else um, is known of her after that. And if she does end up in the underworld, there's actually a story by Amy Scott Hines, which you can read online for free, about Iphigenia falling in love in the underworld and um, kind of starting afresh, which I absolutely adore, called The Virgin Brides, that I'll link down below for you to read because it's just beautiful. The next mentor and student from A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is Androcles Anderson. Yeah, Androcles Anderson, who is named after the fable character Androcles from Aesop's fables. In many ways this fable is similar to the lion and the mouse fable and you might recognise some of the uh, beats from it. Androcles um, is an escaped slave who hides away in a cave only to discover that this cave is the home of a lion. This lion however has a thorn in his paw which of course Androcles being the nice chap he is offers to remove and a wonderful friendship begins. <laughs> so uh, that is Androcles and where he comes from. Mentor number four is Persephone Price, who is naturally named after Persephone, the goddess of spring and queen of the underworld in Greek mythology. So uh, you probably know who Persephone is. She is the daughter of Demeter and uh, the 
wife of Hades, although she is abducted by him in the original mythology, and she then spends part of her year every year in the underworld, which is the winter months, and the rest of the year above um, on the earth with her mother, which is spring, autumn, summer, when things grow and things are happy. Um, I won't go into tons of depth about the myth of Persephone and, and Hades because it's a long one, and I actually have an entire video dedicated to it and why it's not really the cute romantic story that you think it might be. Um, so I will link that down below or somewhere on the screen. Um, but Persephone is an incredibly powerful, um, famous, well-known goddess of Greek mythology who actually long predates many other gods and goddesses in terms of our evidence for names and characters. She's also known as Kori um, and she has a mystery cult with her mother Demeter. Um, so she's really, really important in terms of the ancient Greek pantheon and ancient Greek culture. So um, worth learning more about if you're interested. Student number five, I told you there were a few, is Arachne Crane, who is named after Arachne. Other women who things just don't go great for, <laughs> to be honest. So Arachne is a mortal woman who's just fantastic at weaving. Like Arachne knows how to use a loom, how to use thread, how to just like make the most beautiful tapestries um, and weave the most beautiful images in all of Greece. So much so that she gets a little bit arrogant and talks about how amazing she is. Um, perhaps even comparing herself to the goddess of Athena, who, if you don't know, aside from being the goddess of war and wisdom, is also the goddess of weaving. And Athena, or any of the gods really, don't like to uh, be compared to mortals. They don't like when mortals act as if they're as good as them. They have egos and for that reason Athena comes down furious with Arachne and demands that they compare their skills. So they, they go about having a little competition where they both make a tapestry to see who's better. And Athena's is obviously beautiful. Athena is fabulous at her job. Um, but Arachne's is also incredible and intricate and not only is it beautiful and intricate and expertly done, uh, such skilled craftswomanship um, went into it, it also depicts a lot of the terrible things done by the Greek gods and goddesses. It depicts them um, mistreating mortals, acting like children, doing terrible things and this just further angers Athena and maybe Arachne should have seen that this wasn't the best way to go but it is sort of like an embarrassment and it shows Athena up and she's furious. Um, so she decides uh, to put a spell on Arachne, turning her into a spider so that she can forever weave her little web. And that is uh, where we also get the um, name for Arachnids from. So yeah, that is Arachne. Number six and seven, at least I think this is six and seven, are actually two twins and they are Apollo Ring and Diana Ring, two students once again, who are twins and named after twins. So Diana and Apollo are actually the Roman names um, for the gods, although I say Roman names. Apollo is called Apollo in Greek mythology and Roman mythology, but Diana um, is equivalent in Greek mythology in terms of like synchronization, syn synchronicism in uh, mythology is Artemis. So we have the Roman um, twin god and goddess Diana and Apollo, who are the twin children of Leto and Zeus. Now, Apollo and Artemis, there's too much to say about in uh, one video, or Apollo and Diana. I forget what I'm talking about, sorry. <laughs> um, Apollo and Diana in one video. So um, just for like a quick reference for anybody who's not familiar, Apollo is most famous probably as the god of prophecy, music, medicine, um, what have you. And um, Artemis is probably best known again, as I've already mentioned earlier, as the goddess of the hunt, um, of the wild, of young girls. And um, they are, like I mentioned, twins. So it makes sense that twins would be named after them. There's a little connection in terms of the actual characters and the mythological figures. But lastly, for mythological names in a ballad of songbirds and snakes, we actually have a character who I'm gonna talk about in tandem with a character from the original trilogy, even though the characters are seemingly unrelated, their mythological names are not. And that is Remus Doolittle, who is a game maker in training in the ballad of songbirds and snakes, and Romulus Thread, who is a particularly brutal peacekeeper in the Hunger Games series. So again, I don't know of these two characters being connected in any way, but the names Romulus and Remus are 
inextricably tied together in Roman mythology. Romulus and Remus are the legendary ancestors of Rome um, who are supposedly de descended from the hero Aeneas from Troy who is in turn uh, the son of the goddess Aphrodite or Venus. So like a long line of mythological connection there for, for Rome's legacy, you know, like a little bit of propaganda there. And Romulus and Remus were brothers and founders of Rome. So they were the two babies who were abandoned and initially like sustained and raised by a she-wolf who nursed them, um, then taken in and eventually go to set up Rome. But things do not go so well in the end for Romulus and Remus because they end up having a big disagreement. And in essence this argument really starts with which hill should be the central hill of where they found Rome. Like this is where it all starts. They're just like, I like this hill, no, I like this hill. After Remus insults him, Romulus kills Remus and uh, becomes the primary leader and founder of Rome, equally making the Palatine Hill the centre of uh, the kingdom. So yeah, that's the story of Romulus and Remus. Uh, I mean, it really seems like extremes that they went to there. And that leaves me with three final uh, characters with mythologically inspired names, uh, one of which or two of which come as a pair, and that is Castor and Pollux. So if you're familiar with the Hunger Games, you may know Castor and Pollux as two brothers who are part of Katniss's camera crew in Mockingjay. Uh, so they help her film the like promo rebel inspirational videos that they send out to um, the like rebellion in the capital um, to show that Katniss is on their side and the two cameramen are Castor and Pollux. Uh, Pollux being a uh, Avon who had his tongue removed when uh, he still lived in the capital. And they are actually named after a pair of brothers from Greek mythology, Castor and Pollux, who you may know as the brothers of Helen of Troy. So Castor and Pollux were um, Spartan princes uh, who were often known as the Discuri. As a duo, that's what they were known as in Greek, whereas in uh, Roman myth, they are known as Gemini. So they are the origin of the star sign or the namesake of the star sign Gemini and therefore like the astrological symbol of Gemini and in the end um, of Castor and Pollux's myth, they are actually turned into a star sign. Now there's lots of myths surrounding Castor and Pollux, um, but the one uh, that, that marks the end of their story in which they become these star signs um, is one in which Castor is dying and Pollux is given a offer by Zeus, king of the gods. Um, and this offer is that Pollux, who has been given immortality, can come and live on Olympus um, as an immortal being with the gods, or he can half his immortality and share it with his brother, thus um, becoming these beings in the sky and of course um, with so much love for his brother that's exactly what Pollux does he shares his immortality and that is how they become a star sign which is quite a lovely story and a lovely ending um, for all that there is tragedy involved and then lastly for mythological namesakes we have Lavinia and Lavinia is the red-headed Avox girl from the Hunger Games series who Katniss recognizes um, when she first arrives at the capital as a girl that she saw one time in the woodlands and fields outside of district 12 and she saw her presumably trying to escape the capital um, but then being caught and taken back to the capital where she um, is, is forced into this life of slavery basically um, as an Avox with her tongue cut out and her namesake Lavinia is actually a princess of Roman mythology and the wife of the hero Aeneas who I also mentioned earlier in connection to Romulus and Remus like Greek and Roman myth are both incredibly interwoven and although there aren't a ton of references to her in ancient texts there is a um, novel from her perspective written by a uh, famous science fiction fantasy author Ursula K. Le Guin that you might want to check out if you're interested in a story from Lavinia's perspective but I also think it's interesting that a character who doesn't often have a voice in myth and doesn't get mentioned very often or given an opportunity to speak is also used as the name um, for an Evox in Hunger Games and I don't know if that's something that that Suzanne Collins was thinking when she chose that name. Then we have a character again from A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and one of the students and mentors which is Lysistrata Vickers who doesn't get her name from either mythology or history but instead um, a literary figure. So Lysistrata is the um, protagonist and um, titular character of the play Lysistrata, which is a comedy by the Greek playwright Aristophanes. And in Lysistrata, 
the character of Lysistrata um, initiates a sex strike in which wives and mistresses, what have you, refuse to have sex with their partners and husbands until they end the war. It's a story that has since inspired quite a few like retellings including films like Chirac, which similarly sees the women of the story uh, using a sex strike to try and end uh, the war between two gangs. Um, it's, it's one that like a lot of people have kind of like heard about I think in like reference or reference in other things. It's, it's had quite an impact on um, pop culture I would say. Um, but yeah, it's neither mythological nor historical. It's, it's just a play. <laughs> just a play. Just nothing, eh? But like that's that's where her name comes from. Next up we have five names, all of which um, I believe at least um, are originally taken from the names of Roman emperors. And this is also the point in the video which I'd also like to address another kind of overarching theme in terms of the ancient references in Suzanne Collins' works, which I think are really interesting. So as we've seen already, there are a bunch of different characters um, named after figures from classical myth in ancient history and there are many more to come particularly named after figures from um, ancient Roman history like emperors or empresses or generals or uh, writers or politicians and a few other Greek ones um, mixed in there too. And what you might have already noticed with the names I've mentioned so far and will probably continue to notice with the names I'm about to mention is that almost all of these characters are characters who are originally from the capital. So the district if you can call it a district of Panem which is in charge where the wealthiest live and um, where people have the most freedoms, the people that take the most joy in watching the Hunger Games and those that don't have to sacrifice children to the Hunger Games. So the elite, the capital, the elite um, are the ones with the ancient names and I think that is very much intentional. It has to be in terms of uh, the writing and characterization of her characters. Suzanne Collins has chosen often the names of very wealthy Roman elites um, from Roman Imperial and Republican history um, to name her capital characters after. So I think that's interesting and worth noting and bearing in mind. So who are these emperors? First up we have Titus. He was a tribute from District 6 in a previous Hunger Games that Katniss mentions in which he ended up completely losing it and committing cannibalism. He started eating the other dead tributes and this was not something that the spectators enjoyed and he is named after the Roman Emperor Titus. So Titus was Emperor of Rome not for terribly long actually from 79 CE to 81 CE and he was a member of the Flavian dynasty who were the dynasty uh, that uh, created the Colosseum, <laughs> interestingly enough, who built the infamous Colosseum or as it was actually known in ancient Rome, the Flavian Amphitheatre. Which also brings up the next character I wanted to mention who is Flavius, one of Katniss's like makeover team in the books um, because I assume he is inspired by either Titus as well or just generally uh, members of the Flavian dynasty because Flavius was a name shared by numerous members of this dynasty and this family. So it's not a specific emperor in this instance but I just I just thought it was it was relevant. I don't want to miss it off the list. Uh, moving on to another emperor though and one of probably the most infamous emperors um, and well-known emperors of ancient Rome today and that is Nero. So this is our character who is named in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes um, called Nero Price and he is a um, big businessman. Oh my god, what is the word? Uh, basically like a train tycoon. <laughs> Uh, he's a he's a businessman who's very wealthy um, and a neighbor of uh, the snows but he is named after Nero and it's interesting because one of the first times you hear about Nero in a ballad of songbirds and snakes is when um, you hear about snow and um, well Coriolanus and his cousin Tigris witnessing um, Nero do something really really brutal like really violent and brutal at the beginning of the novel in a sort of early flashback scene and you see this on screen in the film as well although I don't know if they use his name um, but interestingly enough the Emperor Nero is infamous because of how brutal and 
like wild he was supposed to have been. So Nero definitely managed to reign for longer than Titus and he also came before Titus. He was part of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, the dynasty previous to the Flavian dynasty and um, he ruled Rome from 54 CE to 68 CE and there are so many stories about Nero many of which are probably made up, some of which are exaggerated and others of which probably did happen. But um, that is the nature of a lot of our history texts from that time is they almost read like gossip rags of the empire like Suetonius and Tacitus, particularly Suetonius, like that stuff really feels like gossip. Um, but a lot of that gossip is about Nero. Like there's a lot written about Nero because of some of the stuff that he was supposed to have done and some of the stuff he definitely did do, but he was definitely very violent, very unpredictable. Um, he loved his like performances, his gladiator games. He even liked to make people listen to him listen, uh, playing music and uh, loved the spectacle of everything. So I think like that also plays into the themes of the Hunger Games. And so I think that does also play into the themes of like the establishment um, and the early Hunger Games, which is interesting to know. Then since we seem to be working backwards, we have Claudius Templesmith next, who is one of the presenters of the Hunger Games, like one of the voiceover television presenters for the show in Hunger Games. And uh, he is named after Claudius, who is the emperor prior to Nero. And Claudius is actually Nero's stepfather slash adoptive father. So Nero's mother was Agrippina the Younger and Agrippina the Younger was one of Claudius's wives so he'd been married prior to Agrippina um, and adopted her son from her previous marriage when they got together um, thus, thus leading to Nero becoming um, emperor after him although their families were all intertwined to a certain extent already and Claudius reigned from CE 41 to CE 54 when Nero took over. Again there are so many stories surrounding um, these emperors I cannot go into detail about all of them, but I have to say one of my favourite stories about Claudius, uh, which very, very well might not be true, but is also one that a lot of people repeat because of how entertaining it is, is um, that he was actually found hiding behind a curtain when he was appointed emperor. So his predecessor Caligula dies and Claudius thinks, oh no, maybe I'm going to be next. And he ends up hiding behind these curtains only to be found by the Roman Praetorian Guard and um, declared to be emperor. And yeah, I, I, I guess it's probably it's it's more than likely just some sort of rumor to characterize Claudius as a bit of like a wet napkin but it's a fun story. Then lastly we actually have a much later Roman Emperor in the shape of Aurelius. So the character that um, this references is Dr. Aurelius from Mockingjay, um, the doctor who treats Katniss um, for her trauma and her mental health after everything that happened with the Hunger Games and then the rebellion um, and then afterwards even her killing uh, President Coyne and who's also Peter's doctor so um, that is a character that very much just comes up kind of at the end of the books um, but his name comes from the Emperor Aurelius who reigns during the second century CE and what I think is probably most interesting in terms of this comparison is that um, Aurelius was a philosopher as well as an emperor so he was known as like a philosopher em philosoph philosopher emperor. He wrote philosophical texts specifically Stoic philosophical texts, Stoicism being a philosophy founded by the ancient Greeks in the Hellenistic era and one that um Marcus Aurelius was a follower of. So his texts that he left behind, because not all of the Roman emperors um, wrote books or wrote works that have survived, um, if they wrote any at all, um, have become one of his like long lasting legacies, I feel like. People still read Marcus Aurelius's meditations. And I wonder if that is why this doctor who treats um, Katniss um, for her like mental health and her trauma is named after Aurelius because he is also known as a philosopher. Like I wonder if that's the case connection if there was any intentional connection at all. Moving away from emperors though the next category I have is women of the imperial family so empresses or daughters of emperors um, including in fact Agrippina. So there's a character in the Hunger Games a um, gymnasium trainer called
called Agrippina Sickle, who is presumably named after Agrippina either Agrippina the Elder or Agrippina the Younger or both. Um, Agrippina the Younger being the daughter of Agrippina the Elder and Agrippina the Younger being the Empress um, who was married to Claudius, I've already mentioned, and the mother of Nero. Now she, along with Nero, had a ton of rumours about her. Um, she was meant to be very manipulative because, you know, women are. Um, and there was lots of rumours and stories floating around her about things that she did to gain power for herself or for her son, um, how she like got in to marriage with Claudius, um, some really like disturbing stories about her relationship with her son etc. Um, and she's definitely one of the most infamous women I think of Imperial, Imperial Rome. In contrast with Agrippina the Younger's reputation though, um, one of the most supposedly beloved empresses of ancient Rome was actually its first empress, Livia, who was the wife of Augustus, uh, previously known as Octavian, who was the first emperor of Rome. So Livia's reputation was as a real like family woman of outstanding values who represented everything Rome was meant to represent on a moral level and that was in part part of Augustus's propaganda regime because uh, Augustus was very much trying to put forth this like ideal family, this ideal um, unit of like Roman citizens to his people and these values and he introduced a lot of like moral lo morality laws, we could call them morality laws, which dictated how people should behave, how they should get married, um, how they should have children etc etc. So it was all part of this like image um, and a lot of what we know about Roman emperors and empresses really is about propaganda either from them or their their dissenters. So um, that was that was Livia and I actually can't remember if I mentioned but she's the namesake of Livia Cardu who is another one of the students slash mentors in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. And lastly for Imperial women we have Octavia. Octavia in The Hunger Games being another member of Katniss's prep team. So the men and women who get her ready for all of her events and make her look fabulous for the capital and know all of the trends and she again could be named after various women. Now I've mentioned one individual for most of um, the characters so far I've named but bear in mind these are just names so although there's often a most famous example of this name it's likely not a name that only one person owned, that only one person had. Lots of people probably had that name, lots of people definitely had that name and Octavia is one of those names, lots of people were called Octavia and there are a couple of famous Octavias at that, those being Octavia the Elder, Octavia the Younger and Claudia Octavia. So Octavia the Elder was the half-sister of Octavian aka Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. Octavia the Younger, meanwhile, was the full sister of Augustus and half-sister of Octavia the Elder. <laughs> um, so she was Augustus's younger sister. Imagine having two siblings with the same name. And then Claudia Octavia was actually the daughter of Claudius from a previous marriage, a marriage prior to his marriage to Agrippina the Younger. And this meant they ob she obviously wasn't biologically related to his adopted son Nero and became uh, the wife of Nero, which was supposed to be a sort of like way of connecting Nero's lineage further to the previous emperor. He was married to her daughter, but their 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 relationship was not a good one. Um, but for a while, she was indeed Empress of Rome after having previously been the daughter of an emperor of Rome. I just had to go change the camera battery because apparently I've been filming for that long. Back to the topic of this video. Some will say that Rome did exist before the empire and of course they would be right. There was the Republic. There was also before the Republic. But there are some names of Hunger Game characters that seem to stem from figures of the Roman Republic, particularly that very end bit, that big bad dramatic bit where there was many or two triumvirates and uh, the empire was sort of brought in. <laughs> so what kind of led to the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire? And of course the natural person to start with here is Julius Caesar, who is the namesake of the character Caesar Flickerman, another television host for the Hunger Games who interviews all of the contestants very jovially before they go to their death. Um, so you may know Julius Caesar, um, but if you don't or you only know a little bit about him, it's worth noting that Julius Caesar was not an emperor. <laughs> I think this is one of the biggest repeated pieces of misinformation about Julius Caesar is that he was a emperor of Rome. The empire didn't exist 
during Julius Caesar's time. Um, Julius Caesar was of course assassinated um, during this time of political upheaval in the Republic and he was um, a political leader and um, a soldier and a well-known figure and all of that jazz. <laughs> but he was not an emperor. However, the first emperor of ancient Rome, who I mentioned already, Augustus, previously known as Octavian, was his great nephew. So they were related and um, they were very much connected in terms of uh, Augustus's rise to power. Um, but Julius Caesar was was never an emperor. Just a really famous Roman general and statesman um, who was assassinated in 44 BCE on the 15th of March, which is why the 15th of March is now known by some as the Ides of March, um, or by me as my partner's birthday. But I've already mentioned this word triumvirate, and Julius Caesar was one of the co-founders of the first Roman triumvirate, which was a um, allyship, an alliance of three powerful Roman men, specifically Julius Caesar, Pompey and Crassus. And Crassus is another name who appears in The Hunger Games. So Crassus Snow is the father of Coriolanus Snow, aka President Snow, um, who is dead for all of the events of all the books. Like he's not in the books, he's only referenced particularly of course in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes which is all from Coriolanus's Snow's perspective. Um, but he's also one of the co-founders of the original Hunger Games. So Crassus um, was really the one that first pushed for um, and publicised the idea of the Hunger Games. So he played a large role in this situation even coming about. Again, Crassus was a powerful political figure and incredibly wealthy member of the Roman elite who um, served um, in the army and then was also a part of the political scene, particularly as a member of the First Triumvirate, as I already mentioned. You may remember though, if you've seen or uh, read A Ballad of Songbirds and Snake, that it wasn't all Crassus um, in terms of the Hunger Games conception. Uh, there was, of course, also Casca Highbottom. So Casca Highbottom is the dean in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, um, who was the one that originally came up with the idea of the Hunger Games, although he was not as adamant about actually setting it in motion as Crassus was. Crassus was the driving force for um, Casca, it was just an idea. And Casca is also named after a Roman figure of the Republic, in fact, one of the assassins of Julius Caesar. I don't know why I'm smiling so much when I say that. So Casca was a senator, a member of the Roman Senate, um, and one of the um, main co-conspirators to come up with the whole idea around Julius Caesar's assassination. But of course, Casca was not alone, this was a um, teamwork assassination and one of its other like famous members and leaders was Brutus, another political figure in ancient Rome who was responsible for the assassination of Julius Caesar. And Brutus is the namesake of another one of the tributes in the Hunger Games series, specifically a victor from a previous Hunger Games who represented District 2 and was then um, pulled back in during the 75th Hunger Games when um, each district had to offer up previous victors as their tributes rather than children. I will say I am sorry um, if I've not gone into a terrible amount of detail about any of these figures that you'd like to learn more about. Obviously this is quite a long video, it's quite a large expansive topic uh, that features a lot of different people so there's just not really space in this video um, but if you'd ever like more ancient history um, videos then you just have to let me know, uh, send me your requests and I do have an ancient history podcast as well. That's ancient history. So um, always happy to explore these topics in more depth. This is just a bit of an overview. And in saying that, I'm really going hard on the overview section for this next part, um, because as far as I'm concerned, um, none of these people are that important. That's obviously not true, um, but there's only so much I can say about them um, without this getting incredibly dull and dry if you're not that interested in Roman political history. Um, so these characters are characters named after either like generals or politicians or senators or soldiers. Um, we have Cato, aka the same Cato who is in uh, the games with Katniss and Peeta in book one who dies in the um, arena. Um, he is named after either Cato the elder or the younger. I 
don't know. I don't know. I, I wonder though if it's specific or if it's just, I like the name Cato. Both Cato the Elder and Cato the Younger, father and son, however, were both Roman senators for anyone who's interested. Then we have Cinna, aka um, the glorious mastermind behind all of Katniss's phenomenal costumes, who is of course named after Lucius Cornelius Cinna, a soldier and Roman consul during the Republic. Sejanus Plinth, the not really best friend of Coriolanus Snow in um, A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, given the kind of things that Coriolanus says about him, um, who is um, previously a resident of the districts that ends up in the academy at the Capitol, who is named after Lucius Aulius Sejanus, a soldier and friend of the Emperor Tiberius. Gaius Breen, another student and mentor in A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, um, who is named presumably after Gaius, the grandson of the Emperor Augustus. Portia, who is um, Peter's Cinna, basically, who <laughs> came up with Peter's costumes in tandem with Cinna and um, has the Roman name Portia, a famous example of whom is the daughter of Cato the Younger. Fulvia Cardu, who is the game maker Plutarch Heavensby's assistant, who presumably gets her name from the um, aristocratic Fulvia of the Roman Republic, who was um, famed for her various uh, relationships, including a marriage to Mark Antony. And Coriolanus Snow, no, aka President Snow. Now Coriolanus Snow is very very clearly um, and I think it's been acknowledged named after the Shakespeare character and there are various other Shakespeare references throughout the Hunger Games including character names and some of that overlaps with classical mythology and ancient history because Shakespeare in turn took a lot of his names and his characters and his inspiration from these topics as well. Um, so for example there is a character named Cressida um, in the Hunger Games um, and although there's no Cressida in ancient mythology Shakespeare did create a play called Cressida and Troilus, Troilus and Cressida which is set during the Trojan War so like there's a lot of interest weaving there. But Coriolanus is an ancient Roman name and there is um, one notable um, soldier slash general who was also called Coriolanus but the inspiration is clearly Shakespeare in this incident um, because of various other things um, that I don't have time to get into here um, and because I am more interested in ancient history than I am in Shakespeare, sorry. And those are my quick summation characters that I don't care to go into detail about um, but I do have five final names I want to talk a little bit more about because these are all characters whose names are also the names of ancient Greek or Roman writers. Um, so those are the final five I want to talk about. Starting with, why not, Plutarch Heavensby because we just mentioned him. So you probably know Plutarch um, as the game maker in Catching Fire and uh, Mocking Jane and he takes his name from the ancient Greek writer Plutarch. So Plutarch was actually alive during the Roman Empire and he's probably best known for his series of parallel lives. So these were texts in which he would take two figures um, and write about their lives side by side. So they could be either either quite recent or contemporary political historical figures or figures of ancient myth. Um, so for example he wrote Parallel Lives of Theseus who we've mentioned already and Romulus who we've mentioned already. He also wrote Parallel Lives of other writers like Demosthenes the Greek rhetorician and Cicero the uh, Roman rhetorician. But in addition to his Parallel Lives he also wrote a variety of other texts including um, Lives of the Roman Emperors. Um, so he is quite a rich source now for for antiquity um, and you'll probably come across his work if you end up studying ancient history of the Greeks or the Romans realistically because he wrote about so many of them um, and he's a really interesting read to be honest so that is uh, Plutarch. Then we have Strabo Plinth, uh, the father of Sejanus Plinth from A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes who is named after Strabo, another Greek writer who was alive during the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the Roman Empire so he lived during that crossover period um, and he wrote geographical texts. So his best known work and the, the one which um, survives um, the best is the Geographica which is a description of various different places including Greece and Rome, Asia Minor where Strabo lived um, in a variety of different places. Did he travel to all these places? We'll probably never know. Um, but it's really interesting to get a geographical historical perspective um, from a contemporary living at the time um, and it, they're really again valuable 
text if you're looking to study ancient history. In terms of Roman writers, we have Pliny the Elder, who is the namesake of Pliny Harrington, another one of the mentors slash students from um, A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. And Pliny the Elder was actually a resident of Pompeii, who lived in the first century BCE, and he is best known for his works on natural history. So again, the world around you and nature. And he actually died during the eruption of Vesuvius, which uh, led to the destruction of Pompeii, supposedly when he was trying to help rescue um, a, fa a friend and that friend's family. So um, that's a really tragic ending, as is um, realistically what happened in Pompeii in general. It's a really incredibly sad story. Um, he does have a nephew, Pliny the um, Younger, who we actually get this story of his death from. Then we have the namesake for Seneca Crane, the game maker in the first Hunger Games book, um, who was a Stoic philosopher. Again, uh, Stoicism being the same philosophy that Marcus Aurelius purported that um, was um, conceptualised during the Hellenistic era in ancient Greece. And he lived during the early Roman Empire. But finally, for characters and uh, for writers, we have Lucretius. And this is actually my favourite, so I saved it for last. <laughs> so Lucretius is actually the full name of Lucky Flickerman, aka Lucretius Flickerman, um, the television presenter from uh, A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, and he gets his name from the Roman writer and philosopher Lucretius who wrote De Rerum Natura. And De Rerum Natura is actually one of my favourite ancient, ancient texts. I find it fascinating. Um, it is a work of Epicurean philosophy, which again is just a topic I find fascinating. I love Epicurean philosophy. It was a philosophical school, again founded during the Hellenistic era in Greek by Epicurean. Curus, funnily enough, um, and uh, Lucretius wrote a sort of overview of this philosophy and it was a philosophy that basically believed in atoms, a very, very, very early rudimentary version of atomic theory in which we are all made up of tiny, tiny, tiny little things called atom um, and uh, that that is where the term atom comes from and I just love De Rerum Natura so I wanted to finish on Lucretius and make sure anybody who has stuck around to the end of this video goes and picks it up because it's just fantastic and fascinating. But for reference, Lucretius lived during the final years of the Roman Republic. And that brings me to the end of this video. I have no idea how long it's gonna be after I've edited it. We'll all find out, I guess, um, but hopefully it was worth the wait if you have been waiting on it and hopefully you enjoyed it if uh, you watched it even partially or all of it, although you won't be hearing this if you only watched part of it. Um, I'd love to talk more about this topic in the comments down below. Obviously, I couldn't go in depth about everything because it's such a big, big topic and it's four books. Um, so yeah, if we can keep the conversation going, that would be so much fun. I'd really enjoy that. And let me know what other videos you'd like relating to ancient history and classical mythology and I'll see, see what I can do. Um, but until next time, everybody, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye, everyone.